Welcome to Outside the Op, where dentist owners come together to share the cool things they do when they're not being a dentist. It's all about life outside the dental practice. In each episode, we'll dive into the ways these practice owners find their thing, the fuel that helps them balance the stressors and demands of running a business while being an amazing dentist. I'm Paula Parker from The Profitable Dentist, and I'd like to take you Outside the Op. Hey everyone, welcome back to Outside the Op and thanks for joining. Uh, this episode, we're talking to a dentist owner I met earlier this year at Chicago Midwinter and had the privilege of chatting with. And I'm excited for you to meet her too. So let's roll out the wellness carpet for her. Dr. Jen Bell comes to us from North Carolina where she's been practicing dentistry for 15 years. She's the co-owner of Signature Family Dental and now has two locations in the Raleigh era, area. Uh, she is a University of North Carolina Tar Hill alumni, having completed both her undergrad in biology and her DDS there. And if she looks familiar, it's because she's very active in dentistry, both in her practice and outside of her practice. She lectures. She's a KOL. She's a media host. She's an award-winning dental podcaster. She is a dink. That's right. If you follow Dentist in the Know, you'll recognize Jen as one of the hosts. But most importantly, Jen is the mother of three kids with her wonderful husband, Brian, and she's built her work and life in dentistry around making sure that she shows up for her family 100%, regardless of the many hats that she wears. So now you know a little bit about her. Let's say hello. Jen Bell, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is truly a pleasure to finally have a few minutes with you, but most importantly, I want to focus on you and the cool things you do outside of your practice to balance the demands of practice ownership with self-care. Because yeah, so I oh go ahead. Well, I, no, finish your comment. Oh, I just I always like to to give context for the wellness feature that we do in outside the op. And basically, dentistry is hard. Dentistry is hard. Being a business owner is is harder. Um, so you've got the daily challenges coming at you left and right, mentally physically, emotionally. So finding balance for yourself in all of that is critical, right? Absolutely. And, and uh, so when we first talked about doing this interview, uh, we were, the evolution of how I was balancing all these different hats and, and I was pretty upfront with you. And I was like, well, I have a lot of people who help me. I pay, pay many of them. Uh, you know, and I'm very open about the fact that I've had a personal assistant slash nanny uh, support system in our home for about seven years. It took me a long time to make that leap uh, mentally because I'm a little bit of a control freak and I, you know, I, I'm heavily invested in the success of my business and my family. So then relinquishing some of that time and some of those duties to someone, uh, you know, you go through those mental phases of, will they do it as well as I would do it? Will they do it as efficient as I will do it? Uh, will they be good at it, period? Um, but then as you start to let go of some of those things, and it's really true personally and professionally, you free your yourself up to so many other things, you know, just a little bit of gym time. Um, where you can actually maybe go work out for 30 minutes while, you know, your, your helper is taking kids to dance or taking them to softball practice or whatever it happens to be. Um, or you have delegated all the phone calls that you knew you were going to have to make at the end of the day. I need to cancel this membership card. I need to call the bank and move this. I need to do like, I need to call the dance studio and pay my bill. All the things that take 15 minutes and mental bandwidth for you to hang on to being able to delegate that to somebody else was incredibly freeing. And the funny thing is, Paula, when we first talked about this, I had all of that in place. And then in December of 22, she put in her notice. Uh, it was time for her to move back home. She'd been with our family for seven years. So she really was not just an employee, but a, a real, had been a very instrumental part in raising our children and, and keeping our home in order. Wow. And- so, but, but it was all good because she was going home. Uh, she was moving back to her family land to build her family home, to raise her, what was going to be her first child. So it's all wonderful things. But let me tell you the last six months, I became incredibly aware of how bad it is to not have that support system because I went backwards a bit in that journey 
And I was really a miserable person. I mentally, I was in a terrible place. Still am a little bit because you haven't been allowed the freedom to uh, do the things that energize you, you know, cutting out that time to work out, cutting out that time to do a hobby or to spend quality time with your kids instead of being the chauffeur for them. Um, you know, I, I am painfully aware now how much my mental happiness was predicated on the fact that I had that support system in place. We've had somebody with us for the summer. Her last day is today. So I'm mentally already prepared for the idea that, uh, I have to refocus and look at the fall and, and, and we're trying to assess our family's needs to determine, you know, what does the next person who comes to be a part of our team, what will they look like? What do we need from them, et cetera. But we are, keenly aware of how important it is. And that's a great example of the ebb and flow of all the emotion yep. that surrounds you while you're trying to be this, this person, this, this mom, this practice owner, this caretaker, this you know, clinician, team leader, leadership, all of it, all yep. of it. You said something that um, really resonated with me about your journey on the work-life balance thing. Um, you said, I surround myself with the most amazing and competent people who share the desire for success in their respective roles. Um, that's an extremely level of, uh, extremely high level of self-awareness, I think. And I admire that so much in you um, because, you know, the saying like we're influenced with the people, like the five closest people we surround ourselves with. Um, so along those lines, you choose to surround yourself with people in your orbit that no matter what they do, just like the, the, the person that you depended on to be a part of your family and an integral part of your life. Um, they're the best that they can be in the role that they, they have. Um, and they, they push to that. And that's just simply smart to always surround yourself with the best, no matter what they're doing. Absolutely. And the self-awareness piece to know what your deficiencies are, to be very aware that you, you cannot be good at all things and you have strengths that you can, uh, yes. you can exploit if you will. And you have weaknesses, um, that really show up in chaotic situations. So not only do I try to surround myself with the best and, you know, I'm sure most people strive for that, but I really try to fill in the gaps in my own weaknesses. So the individuals that I like, surround myself with are uh, great examples of the things that I don't do very well. So, you know, our personal assistant, super organized um, and very structured in her schedule. And uh, those are not things that I always excel at, you know, and I'm not good at walking into a closet and organizing it and turning it into this, you know, vision that we can make ourselves very productive and efficient using that space. And she was good at those things. So, you know, it, it's the same with my business partner. Uh, I'm not always really great at conflict or um, being as direct or, you know, those types of personality traits. And I do have a, I have trouble at times uh, being very decisive um, and being okay with my decision. My business partner is very opposite of that, which has made our partnership, our business relationship incredibly beneficial because where I'm weak in those areas, she steps in and sort of fills that gap very successfully. And I think I have other gifts that I do the same for her, uh, but it's that nice balance. And, you know, we all often tend to want to surround ourselves with people who are much like us. And there is benefit in that, but also being aware of the things that you don't do well and then trying to fill those gaps in your leadership positions around you um, really, I think, make you an even more successful and effective. Like I look a lot better because they all do the things that I'm not so great at doing. Yeah, no. And I, I, that's spot on because I think that I know my younger self did associate with people that I had a lot of commonality with and that made me comfortable. Mm -hmm. And the, the further I got along, the more, especially in my professional life, my former career, um, was in a corporate setting. So that's a, it's always like a difficult balance to find yeah. people who you want to mentor you and who you can trust and who you work well with and who make up those deficits that you might have. Um, Without explaining them to their own advantage, right? You know? Yeah, exactly. But yeah. I realize the value of pushing myself into relationships now where I have to get comfortable because I know I can learn and grow from the people that I'm associating myself with now. And 
it's become less and less of a challenge because you do, you walk away with their wisdom and their outlook and you learn so much from them that helps you balance out. Yeah. So I do love that. Um, Let's dive into you just high level about um, your career as a dentist. And then we're going to shift back again to more of you personally. Um, so tell us about how you became a dentist. Cause I, I like this story from you. So uh, never was on part of my career journey. Uh, never really hit my radar. And I was home visiting my hometown dentist who had, I'd been a patient of his father's and then he, went to dental school and came in and, and was working alongside his father in a family dental practice in our community. And, you know, he sat me up at the end of my checkup and said, well, how's school going? You know, have you thought any more about what you want to do? And I said, yeah, I think I'm going to go to bed school. You know, I'm finishing up my bio degree. And I, I think that's what I've kind of got laser locked on. And he said, oh, you don't want to do that. He said, you definitely don't want to go to dental. You want to go to dental school. This is where it's at. You don't want to waste your time in med school. And I said, I'm pretty sure I want to go to med school. And he was like, no, no, you come work for me this summer. Just here I am. You know, it's like May. I've just finished up with school. And he's like, no, come work for me this summer. And uh, you can see what we do and, and get a better feel for what dentistry is. And, and then maybe I can change your mind. And first off, what a leap of faith. Like he knows me, but we're not family friends. It's not like we vacationed together and our families were all uh, in community with each other. I mean, he'd just been our family dentist for a very long time. So we had that continual relationship, but beyond that, it wasn't like we were pen pals or, you know, communicating beyond those regular checkups. So first off, what a leap of faith he took to just offer me a job on the spot. And then he was freaking right. I mean, I, I fell in love with the profession after I screwed up so many times. I mean, I really thought for sure I'd get fired on multiple occasions. Like one time I, and keep in mind, I know nothing about dentistry. I don't, other than my experience as a patient, my scope and understanding of what they do is incredibly small. So, you know, they were trying to teach me, this was back when we were doing dip tanks still, and we had the feeder machines for the radiography. And, you know, they were teaching me how to run things through uh, the machine in the dark room. And anyone who's done this or participated in this process probably has screwed up at least once, but I definitely had no appreciation for how to feed it all in. So the dental assistant had taken this beautiful full mouth series and I strategically managed to glue it all together by running it so fast through the dip tank. So it came out, these are all little individual x-rays that came out all glued together, totally worthless, which probably had taken her 10 minutes to capture. So I walk in, I'm like, I don't know much about much, but I'm feeling like this is not what you were expecting <laughs> at the end. And she's, of course, she was a little miffed with me and I was pretty disappointed in myself, but rest assured, I never made that mistake again. Right. Uh, anyway, all those experiences culminated together. So I ended up working for them for about three summers. And then if I was home on breaks and stuff, I'd come help out. And I did fall in love with, with the practice of dentistry. I loved the combination of it being both a diagnostician and kind of a problem solver, uh, but also actually having the ability to solve the problem. And, you know, in medicine, many times those two worlds don't come together. You're either a surgeon or you're a primary care physician, and you might diagnose and point folks in the right direction for treatment, but you don't render the care. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect and dentistry is so unique that way that we get to dig deep, do the tests, learn, understand, but then we actually get to solve the problem by using clinical and technical skills. And so really was a great marriage for me personally and professionally to kind of put some of the things that I enjoyed together. Yeah. Cause it is, it's end to end care yeah. so in medicine. You're always pushing out to specialists or whatever, and you may be a PCP, but you see that person one time a year. Right. Um, and we're, we're a part of their family. I mean, you know, I now have patients cause we've been in our practice for uh, we cold started in 2010. So we've been there for a little over 13 years. I mean, I've seen kids grow up. I've yeah. watched, uh, we've had patients pass away. We've watched people get married and divorced. And, you know, we've gone through all these journeys with different families and uh, really blessed to have been a part of their life and life in our community for all this time. Yeah, that that's absolutely true. Actually, I went to the dentist the other day for my cleaning. I go three times a year because- I'm crazy about getting my teeth. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and I was talking to my hygienist and she said, you know what, Paula, like I have been to everything. I have been to baby showers, bridal showers, weddings. Yeah. She's like, these people have taken me into their lives and made me part of their life and their family. And she's like, I just, it's uh, incredible to me. So I did have that dialogue with her and I thought it was really interesting and cool for sure. Um, as a seasoned dentist and practice owner, because I think this is really important and we won't spend a lot of time on it, but what are, because I like to ask everybody this, because you all come from different angles here. As a practice owner, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing right now? Uh, I would say consistently, it's just the cost of operating the practices and then uh, the fact that, and the data is is justifying how we feel the fact that the, the reimbursement and the pay schedules just aren't keeping up with that sort of trajectory. So, you know, certainly if you're in network, you're feeling that pinch a bit because uh, reimbursement rates are only up about 2.2%. And in some states, they're flat um, where, you know, overhead and expenses are up about 7 to 8%. Um, and so the P&Ls are looking different. Uh, we're having to adjust to new metrics of how to operate business practices where we had a pretty good feel for 25 years that your staffing costs should be X percentage of your gross receipts, your uh, lab costs should be X percent, your mm-hmm. ex, you know your supply costs should be X percent. Um, but now we have to adjust all of those values and uh, squeeze more and more on that profit line. And frankly, for the first time in quite some time, we're seeing a decrease in dentist salary. So I think, you know, there is this kind of heavy compression starting to happen on practice owners, particularly individual ones. There's a lot of uh, sucking up in the market of, of these individuals. And, and I, you know, I actually have experienced that myself. And I, I think um, it's going to be an interesting 12 to 18 months to see how the landscape changes for dentists. Um, and what the long-term outcome for the single practitioner or the small group, yeah. but the individual private, privately owned and held practices, what they will look like um, and how they'll survive. Will they diversify uh, their offerings? Will they leave networks? Will they um, go completely fee-for-service and decrease their dependency on staff? Um, you know, because I do think those are some of the crossroads that many practices are having to look at right now. Yeah. Um, that all said, because that goes back to the, the mental stress there, of, yeah, absolutely. Which, which is a trickle down to everything else. Yeah. Um, cause it's, you know, you, you have to make a living at this. You have to make a profit at this. You have right. to be a profitable dentist. So Considering all of that, um, because you are very busy, busy, um, I'd like to talk now more about your work-life balance and how you find your thing outside of your practice and dentistry and all the things that you're involved in so that you can decompress a little bit. Because yeah. I think you, you got to have some decompression time. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and wine doesn't count, right? I shouldn't. Wine probably. does count. It does count. Good. Cause that's definitely Good. part of my. So does bourbon. <laughs> we'll put that in the all encompassing uh, substances or just, you know, enjoyable drinks. Yeah, uh, wine definitely is part of my decompression plan. <laughs> um, I, uh, so no, first off, I would say one of the best gifts that we gave ourselves during COVID uh, prior to COVID in our practice, we were running uh, early days and late days. We were running longer days. Um, and when COVID happened, it was kind of this awesome opportunity to sort of change things and you could blame everything on COVID, right? So we got got by with changing a lot of stuff and saying, well, COVID sort of forced our hand. But in reality, it was really the time to make some of those moves. It just made it less painful to have to explain it to patients. Uh, but we... we consolidated our work schedules down. So now we work 8.30 to 3 or 8.30 to 4 each day. So, you know, I'm rarely leaving the house before the kids are off on the school bus and I'm home in pretty short order thereafter to help and participate in the games and activities and stuff in the afternoon. Um, you know, I think the the misconception I had early in practice that took a long time for me to mature and understand 
was that I don't have to be the dentist for every patient. And yes, we did a lot of things early to create a profitable stream to the practice so we could pay our mortgage and, you know, service uh, the debt that we had accumulated. But once we got to a healthy spot where we were no longer sort of a, a victim of that, we started to gift ourselves some freedom back and being okay that patients are going to leave. Uh, you leave a network and some patients will leave you over $15 and that is okay. Cause we're not the dentist for everybody and mm -hmm. being comfortable saying that to patients who complain that you are not the Walmart uh, that's open from seven to 12 AM and you don't have availability and you won't, you know, give them the cheapest cost on a DO composite, like being okay to say that's okay because I just can't be the dentist for everybody um, is sort of a healthy reminder to consumers that we are humans, we are people raising families and doing other things outside of the, the practice in our communities. So this is our job, but it is not our life. And so that was one of the things we did. And that's been tremendous for me for kind of getting better at the work-life balance, surrounding myself with really good, strong people who help uh, balance that, whether it's a neighbor or friend who doesn't mind doing pickup every now and then for the kids or, you know, sort of getting a good community and tribe, if you will, around that uh, is taking care and looking out for one another and then just finding hobbies. So I, I actually always thought I was an extrovert, but in reality, I think I've realized that I'm an introvert pretending really good at being uh -huh. an extrovert. Uh -huh. So uh, dentistry is actually mentally pretty exhausting for me at the end of the day, because I've had to engage in a lot of uh, small talk and conversation and found that I actually don't get a lot of energy off. I enjoy them and I love the people, but it actually sucks a lot out to be that way for eight, nine hours at a time. So most of the hobbies I enjoy away from the office are uh, much quieter hobbies. Like I love to bake uh, for the kids in particular and, and really have gotten into bread and just cooking in general. If I am I mean, curious about how something is made, well, I'll Google it, I'll watch YouTube and then I'll go try to see if I can actually execute it in the kitchen. And I, that's a very uh, quiet time for me. Often nobody wants to help generally speaking. Uh, I could have a glass of wine. So it's a good excuse to be very Italian, which I'm not, but I, you know, it seems feels right <laughs> to have a glass of wine and be making bread at the same time and sort of decompress from that. And the same with, you know, messing around in the garden outside or any of those types of activities I do at the house, or, or even just playing a board game with my kids or, or something that's just bet with people who are in my safe space where I don't have to pretend to be on um, and be funny and witty and, and all those things at that time uh, are ways that I decompress and sort of separate myself from just the, the demands of the professional life. Yeah, it's funny that you bring that up because I was in corporate healthcare for a very long time before I transitioned over to working with um, Steve here at the magazine. And I remember doing this um, offsite team exercise about emotional intelligence. And during that, I found out that you could be an introverted extrovert or an extroverted introvert. I am definitely an introvert, but at times, especially professionally, you have got to push beyond that and be extroverted. Mm -hmm. And it is exhausting because yep. fundamentally, that's not who you are. I love right. people. But to maintain a conversation and go from person to person to person to person, and like you have to do and always shift and mold to have that conversation, that meaningful conversation with a patient mm -hmm. um, would definitely suck the life out of me. And yeah. we are kind of one in the same. And then when we transition over, because um, at home, I have this conversation all the time. It could be eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. Hooking dinner is my way of decompressing. Yeah. And if I have a, a glass of wine or a dirty martini, which I don't every day, um, that is my joy. It's not a chore. It is how I decompress yep. from our constant on the go life. Um, and even though our kids are grown, I still feel that. Um, I think fundamentally it's it's who we are, who I am, and that I have to always be busy. I have to always be moving and doing things to the point where sometimes I exhaust myself. Yeah. And I would, that's so true. I, <clears throat> uh, the decompression piece of it that happens with cooking, even though it's a chore and I know some people don't enjoy it. And I, I totally get that because it also comes with the cleanup part of it. Um, but you know, mentally, it actually turns on a different part of my brain 
uh, to, to execute a meal or something I've never tried before or, or trying to do that. And I actually find myself stop worrying about something maybe that happened at the office, a bad Google review that came through, you know, mm -hmm. a staff member issue we're dealing with, a procedure that didn't go maybe the way that I wanted it to go that day. If I turn my focus and energy on something that's equally productive, uh, but doesn't maybe come with quite the same pressure and stress, I do find so much, I do find I'm in a much better mental space to be present for my people when I get home. If I go straight from work to running the kids around in activities to one compression event after another, uh, I'm not the person I need to be or want to be, frankly. I don't even want to be around myself at that point uh, by the end of those types of days. So trying to carve out time or, you know, and it could be working out or investing back in your own personal, physical and mental health. But those times are really important. One of the other things that I thought of when you were talking, um, uh, for all of our extroverted introverts out there or introverts in general, uh, <laughs> I've also found though that I begrudgingly hang out with extroverts. Some of my best friends are extroverts because they force me to get out of my home. I'm pretty sure I would become a hermit where I would just like go to work and then I'd come right back home in my yep. space and cook and, and maybe I would invite them over and I would feed my family, but I'd be pretty good in that little circle Yep. And they are people, people, and they want to be out and they enjoy it. And they're really good about making me come along and like dragging me out. And I, I actually find when I'm in those circles with other women and, and we're, you know, talking about crap we're dealing with, with our kids or our husbands or what vacations we're going to go on, all that kind of fun stuff to talk about. I do get energy from that. And I, I do need that also as part of my decompression. I just don't naturally seek it and uh, am quick to dismiss it as part of my own mental health. Uh, it, it, exactly the same for me. And I do the same things. Like it's going back to pushing myself still into situations where I don't necessarily want to be. I am happy at home. I am yeah. happy with my hands in the earth, digging in the dirt and being by myself and just doing something that I feel like is meaningful and I'm, and I'm accomplishing something different now that I've made a big switch right. midlife um, professionally because, and, and you brought up a good point. Um, it is hard to handle professional, what you perceive as professional rejection. Right. And growing out of that and being more comfortable in how you deliver the, the goods that you bring to the table um, it's still really a challenge for me. I've actually started my own business in the last two years and I'm not fully focused on it because I, I am, am balancing what I do here as well. But at the same time, I, it, it's really hard to push through putting yourself out there, um, to drive a wellness awareness and, and really customers back to yourself, because I'm still terrified of professional rejection, even though I know right. that, I put everything that I've got into delivering what people need. So it's just an interesting journey through that, Absolutely. especially again, as you get older. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You, you become, you know, so much more aware of your own shortcomings and, but in, in the process of doing that, you, you evolve into a much better, I think eventually a much better version of what your potential had always been. Um, oh, shoot, yeah. And I see that so much with all colleagues at this sort of, you know, middle crossroad where they're st still working, but they've developed enough experience, life experience, professional experience. And um, you, you start to see the real fruits of all of that coming together, which is pretty cool to watch people. Yeah, for like sure. Amazing versions of themselves. So, yeah. Um, so here's the big takeaway, I think. Okay. For our discussion today, um, I want for you to be able to give advice to other dentist owners about the importance of fun. It, and it's not one thing. I think it's a variety of things for people um, where you find that that work life balance and yourself outside of dentistry and you figure out the importance of your own personal wellness and how does self-care self cares. You shouldn't feel bad about self-caring. Nope. Um, I always go back to the flight attendant thing. Cause we fly a lot. You know, it is so true. You got to put the oxygen mask on first before you can take care of your kids or your husband or anyone else that is um, challenged around you. You've got to be that person. So as far as your take on this, what's the advice you would want to broadcast out to your peers? 
Oh gosh. Uh, well, I love that analogy. Cause I think that's uh, and so true. Mo- and honestly, for most people in dentistry, yeah. that is not our initial, uh, that's not how we behave. Generally speaking, we're actually very altruistic people as a, as a collective profession. Uh, we give of ourselves almost to our own detriment in many instances. I mean, think about what we do physically every day. And I'm, I'm willing to crank my neck to the right for 12 hours to do all these different procedures just so my patients can be more comfortable and, and allow me to do the work. Um, so I think as a profession, we're really quick to forego our own comfort and our own well-being for those around us, whether it be patients, family members, whatever. And so, you know, my key takeaway is as we mature, finding those things that do make us happy and being aware of what what real joy feels like um, and how we can seek that out in a healthy and productive manner um, so that we can be the best versions and oxygenated appropriately so that we're then serving those who we care about the most. I think it's a misconception to think that us at our full depleted state is still providing the best version of what we have to offer uh, to those who need it. And, uh, you know, we have to we have to have our tanks full first to give the best to those who depend on us. Yep. One hundred percent. Jen, um, we're going to wrap up here and I thank you for your candor and your sincerity. Um, you have a lot of wisdom in your journey through your profession. And, um, I like the fact that you said, uh, or you had shared with me that you kind of figured out that you have to run your life like you run your business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, My husband and I have dates where we have like calendars out and it's goals, it's financial goals, it's vacation goals, it's it's life goals of what we both want to make sure that you know we're both serving each other well, yeah. uh, that we're heading down the same trajectory, and that uh, you know we manage any potential future resentment and other things that may come along because we weren't clear of what our goals and objectives were with one another. So yeah, I, it's it's I'm not perfect. I'm incredibly open book, and I have screwed up more times than I would really care to divulge on your podcast, but, uh, but I am also very open when I find something that I think worked well, whether I learned Mm -hmm. it from somebody else, uh, or just sort of stumbled on it in my own journey to say, look, maybe you could spare yourself five minutes of headache, uh, because I already had to go through it. So, you know, maybe you don't have to experience the same challenges. Yeah, no, um, actually my belief, I think we all find, um, common ground when we're when we can be transparent yeah. about our own journey, our own mistakes, our own lessons learned, and we're willing to share it um, because a lot of people aren't. But when okay. you share those experiences that you've had with the people around you, um, that's how we continue to learn. That's how we continue to grow. Um, we, we don't want to we don't want to stand still. We want to right. keep the journey going for as long as we can. Um, so that said, I want to throw a few bonus questions at you. Okay. Lightning round. Here we go. <laughs> Just as we wrap up. So what's something that your peers do not know about you? Uh, that I did not get into dental school the first time. Uh, I think nobody really talks about it. Uh, <laughs> some folks knew in my dental school <laughs> class. I don't know that anybody really knew about me. I definitely didn't advertise it against. I am I am transparent, but I don't divulge all of my secrets. So I didn't get in the first time, felt pretty rejected uh, after that. And uh, then decided I was, I, I left that space going, well, maybe I don't want it. Maybe, the, maybe the, the signs of the universe and God is telling me I wasn't meant to be a dentist. So maybe just take this pause to figure out what you want to do. So then I went through this journey of like, I had a new career every week. I was researching whether I wanted to be a lawyer. Did I want to go into higher ed? Did I want to go to med school? Did I want, like, did I want to do all these things? And I would spend the week like deep diving into each career path and ultimately ended up right back at dentistry. Uh, And then I made myself wait one year, which actually meant I totally missed a full class. So I was actually... I didn't get in the first year. I missed the full application cycle for the second year. So the third year out of college, I applied and got in. I applied late, barely got into the last interview and then got accepted it to UNC. Probably some for maturity. I took no additional coursework. I didn't take the DAT again. 
I just sort of separated myself from the field altogether to make sure it was what I really wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, I think that was really healthy. And then at that one year mark, exactly. I allow myself the idea to continue on the dental journey. And I think it worked out pretty well. Again, that's a lot of self-awareness for in your early twenties and yeah. a lot of smart. It was a lot of crying and whining in between. Like I make it sound really grand, but at the time it was, uh, you know, especially because most people who are going through this journey have been high achievers for a really long time. It's probably was without a doubt, one of the most significant rejections. Uh, but I think probably the most necessary. Frankly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, again, it's the only way that we learn. That's right. What That's we right. want to be and what we don't want to be. Exactly. exactly. Um, okay. What's the coolest thing you've ever done? Cause I love this question. So one year, actually 2019, so before COVID, everything's before COVID or after COVID, uh, <laughs> we had this last minute opportunity to go um, to see the masters. And uh, it was something we've been wanting to do for a long time. But as most people know, it's really hard to get tickets. And we somehow through some connections scored Sunday tickets. Well, I had already committed to my sister uh, to go to the NASCAR race in Bristol, or uh, excuse me, in Richmond, Virginia, because my um, brother-in-law works for Toyota and he had uh, this great suite opportunity. So we were going to have this incredibly cool experience. We got uh, hot passes, which meant we were allowed to go into the pit during the race, which is very rare and completely yeah. wild and intense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we saw this whole thing. Well, so now I'm feeling pretty torn. Like I really... I made this commitment with my sister, but gosh, it's like master's tickets on a Sunday. It's those are really hard to come by. So what we ended up doing was the race was on Saturday. The master's was on Sunday. So we go up to the race. We spend the full day with my sister, brother-in-law, stay the night in Richmond. We have booked a flight to get to Augusta and we're going to land around 11 o'clock, which for the master's works out pretty well because they generally, uh, the the big groups you want to see are generally teeing off around that time. Well, fast forward this massive storm is going to come through Augusta. And uh, so they've now decided to bump up all tea times to seven o'clock and they cluster a bunch of people together. So we're now on this flight to Augusta. We don't know if when we get there, the masters will even be going, like, will it be over? Yeah. Uh, Well, we get to Atlanta and we had a small connection to Augusta and the storm was already so bad there that the flight to Augusta got canceled. So now we're stuck in Atlanta, still trying to get to the Masters, and we're following the updates, and there still seems like there's going to be a pretty good bandwidth of time. So we hire an Uber driver. He doesn't know, I think, when he takes the ride that he's now driving to Augusta, which is like (laughs) an hour and a half, two hours from Atlanta. So we get in the Uber. um, We go all the way to Augusta. We get checked in. We go to the Masters. Of course, we immediately go get our pimento cheese sandwich and our swag because... (laughs) They're going to shut all that down before the thing ends. So we're like, going ahead and go and get the merchandise. Then we go out to the course and just happen that we end up at the tee box on 18 where Tiger hit his finals. He had his final big round there to win the Masters. And we're in the ESPN documentary. I mean, we're like super tiny little oh people. Outside. But we, I mean, it was like this epic 24, 48 hours of, you know, we met a lot of famous people at the NASCAR event. Then we got to witness kind of a moment in history, hopefully not Tiger's last win at the masters, but quite possibly could be. And, uh, and just, it was such an an event. It was an event for the ages for sure. And it did storm massively after that. And they (laughs) they cleared a hundred thousand people off of the course in 30 minutes. I mean, you just never have seen anything like it. So well, I appreciate that as a true Southerner, you went straight to the uh, pimento cheese. Of course, and a beer, you know, you had to have the beer and the pimento cheese. Pimento cheese is the move. For sure. Um, well, on that note, what's the goofiest thing you've ever done? Oh, gosh, I do so many like really goofy, terrible <laughs> things. Um, so it's really hard to narrow that down. Um, but one that most of my friends who I've been in dentistry along with that remind me of a fair amount I um, was at a dental uh, dental practice meeting for the AGD, which is one of their national councils. And um, my husband was going to surprise me in Chicago with a visit. And he actually surprised me with tickets to see Hamilton, which at that time was going to be my first time seeing it. And um, so he's trying to come from Michigan. He's driving from Milwaukee, which normally would be an, about an hour and a half ride. 
I've got to go to a dinner. And then when the dinner's over, I'm going to slide out early and we're going to meet over at the theater. So he's texting me because it starts to snow on his drive. And now what was a one and a half hour drive became a four hour drive to get to Chicago. So he's texting. He's like, I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. And I was like, well, I mean, I'm at a Brazilian steakhouse and there's a ton of food here. I oh think, my God. I think I could probably get you dinner. And so my friend Arlene was sitting beside me and she was dying laughing because like stuff would come and I would just grab napkins and wrap up like lamb and chicken and some rolls. And then like, by the time I was done, I had a full four course meal in my purse. All the meat. So, I know, and it smelled awful. So, uh, and it was mostly meat, like 90% meat because it was the Brazilian steakhouse. So I leave the restaurant. I want you to know the thing I felt most bad about was that I did take one cotton napkin and I felt pretty bad about that because I definitely stole that cotton napkin. They won't miss the napkin, Jen. But Ar Arlene reassured me that they were not going to be upset about the napkin. And so I said, okay, well, so we get, it, Brian doesn't know I've really like filled my purse with all this food. And so we get to the theater, we <laughs> connect in the lobby. I mean, it is showtime. We go straight in, no time to spare, sit down. He goes, I am so hungry. And I, like an old lady, pull out my big purse, I open up out? the top and I was like, what do you want? Do you want to start with <laughs> some yeast rolls or do you want to go straight to the chicken? And he's like, what in the world? And he looks in and there's just so much meat and it's starting to fall out of the napkins. And, and as soon as I open the purse, you know, like the guy eating the egg salad sandwich or the tuna fish sandwich on the plane, that's exactly what it felt like. Like everybody could smell the Brazilian steakhouse just wafting out of my uh, giant purse. But I was going to say, you must have had a big ass purse. It, it was a big ass purse. <laughs> but let me tell you, that boy hunkered down on some meat. Okay. They're carving the meat. You're putting it. Yeah. He's over there eating shish kebabs and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, he made it through the three hour performance enough that we could then get dinner again for him, where <laughs> I subsequently donated my cotton napkin to that establishment because it looked. I like good. your moves. That, there's the same black napkin. <laughs> Pay it forward. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, finally, who do you admire most in your life? Who's had the most influence on you? This is a good question. Uh, yeah, my parents, for sure. I know that's a very cliche answer, but um, mm -hmm. I think for good parents, that's the answer that you want to hear. Um, both my parents came from incredibly uh, challenging childhoods and uh, my, my dad suffered pretty extreme poverty. And so um, and, and their father relationships were pretty challenged. So uh, for them to really overcome a pretty crappy start to life, uh, for them to have w women in their lives, their moms who were pretty strong, mm -hmm. who despite some significant challenges still managed to raise some pretty well-adjusted human beings who didn't starve to death, even though at times there probably was some concern about that. Um, and then for them to turn into people who could raise healthy children, the mm -hmm. mental and psychological process that has to happen to yeah. remove yourself from the victim mentality for that, to empower you to be a better version of the people who raised you, as opposed to it being an excuse for your own shortcomings. Um, you, you have to look at that and say, I mean, you have to be in awe of sort of their own personal story and journey, uh, you know, to raise a kid who was the first to go to college in their family to, to fundamentally change their family tree and and the trajectory of of where they were going to go um is an incredibly admirable journey and then to to carry that with me as part of my journey and to sort of continue to sort of instill where we came from and uh you know that we have been poor before and we could be poor again and so we're very mindful of hard work a yeah. strong work ethic Yes, um, yes. you know, and, and being sure that we don't take any of those gifts that we've been given for granted. Yeah. And again, pay it forward in right, life. Absolutely. Always paying it forward. Um, so many people get caught in the victim trap and can't absolutely. find their way out of it. And then the cycle continues with their own. That's right. Kids. So, and I don't begrudge them because I know trauma is very difficult and, you know, so that's, I think that's why I, I admire my parents so much is that, uh, whatever gift they were given, whether it was divine intervention or whatever, but they were able to overcome and uh, change, change the way that our family looks forever. And so, um, you know, it's just, a, it's an admirable journey that they've had. 
It is. And it's interesting to think about how it has impacted you specifically around just like your journey and getting through or into dental school and right. the perseverance you had, but the the kind of the, the fact finding way to getting back to reapplying. Exactly. Um, I always told my boys that my number one thing for them is perseverance, just persevere, get yeah. on the other side of it. Um, it'll, it'll be a gift. So uh, uh, interestingly, and how old were you when you kind of figured out that they were the people that you admired most in life? Um, I think pretty young. I don't think I knew, I don't think admiration probably came until I was much older. Um, and especially in raising my own children and, yeah. and kind of understanding how you try not to let old hurt and trauma and things kind of carry into how you raise your children. Yeah. Um, I appreciated very early the journey that they both had been on because we were still pretty poor. And so, you know, I wasn't raised with, with much wealth or frankly much wealth at all. And my mom was a working mom, which was pretty, uh, much rarer at the time. And we yeah. were trying to balance all those things. And so they were very upfront with, their financial situation, uh, with why we don't spend what we spend on certain things. And we lived pretty frugally for a long time. And they were very, they were very upfront about that part of our lives. And I appreciate that because, um, it allowed me to participate in the process as opposed to sort of trying to shelter me mm -hmm. and make it look like it was one way. And in reality, it was a very different way. Um, I was allowed to then participate in the process and help make decisions even on my own behalf that, you know, were being a good steward of, of our family. So I think I do, I try to be pretty upfront with our, my children as well about the realities of the economy, about how we run our house, about what it takes to make things happen on a daily basis, uh, to be able to put food on the table. And, uh, you know, at least currently they all show a pretty strong work ethic, um, and a value of what, not an obsession with money, but a value of the, the role that money plays in your lives and affords you what opportunities, both for mm -hmm. yourself, but also uh, to love and gift on others, which is, you know, lucky for us because of my parents' sacrifices, we're at a, a financial place now where we not only can earn enough to take care of our wishes and needs, but also to start gifting to others to, to get them on better paths as well. Yeah. Another word I love is gratitude. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's the best word ever. Yes. Um, well, Jen Bell, thank you. It flew by. You said it was, was going to be short, but it flew by and it was so fun. You are a very special person and I love you. And I am very grateful to you for talking with me and doing this with me um, and pushing me to do this. Um, it's not Isn't always it easy fun to... just to hang out and talk to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our little um, introverted selves, but when yes. it's just this, it doesn't feel as painful. Yes. Um, it's all, or in... maybe so. I don't know. It's all in who you talk to also, That's you know, but congratulations with the success of everything that you're into and doing. Um, I went through your website, you're everywhere, but I do love the work that you're doing with Dinks and the reason that you're doing it and how you all got there and found it like during COVID. Yeah. Um, so congratulations on the success. It's every Wednesday evening. Um, and we will see you soon out in dentistry. <laughs> Can't wait. Ola, thank you so much. It's thank always fun to share and, you know, put your story out there and, uh, Maybe, maybe impact somebody somewhere. So thanks. Again I hope so. That's the intent of this. So thank That's you. Right. Thanks again. Same. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much for spending a few minutes with us. I think talking to colleagues about their approach to life and career always leaves me inspired to think broadly and differently. And I hope it does for you too. If you'd like to be featured for a future episode of Outside the Op, click the link in the show notes below and let us know about your thing. And hey, while you're there, leave your comments, please, and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons so we can stay connected. I'm Paula Parker from The Profitable Dentist. Go do your thing and be well.